Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this afternoon. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, welcome to our webinar on Water Utility Operator certi Certification, Basic Water Math. My name is Savannah Bekowski and I work at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. I would like to note that throughout this webinar, we will be reviewing some example equations. If you can, we do suggest to grab a pencil and a piece of paper to keep near you if you wish to work through the problems in real time with our presenter. And during the webinar today, everyone will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. Sorry folks, now my screen is sharing. <laughs> um, but so for a little logistics, um, we will be, everybody will be kept on mute to ensure audio quality. And if you have a question, please type it into the question dialog box on your GoToWebinar control panel. You can type in your question at any time throughout the session. The session will be providing example math problems. The presentation slides are numbered. Please indicate the slide number with your question if it relates to that math problem. We will be holding all questions for a Q&A at the end of the presentation. We will be posting a pre the presentation as well as the video recording on the website located in the bottom left-hand corner. You will be, you will be receiving a follow-up email that includes a link to all of these materials. We do not submit our webinars to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits. We do provide certificates of attendance as a courtesy. It can take one to two weeks to send out certificates of attendance, and you must attend this entire webinar to receive one. You must have joined this webinar using the unique join link emailed to you when you registered in order for us to count your attendance. We cannot guarantee that this webinar will meet requirements for specific CEU or licensing renewal needs, but if you have any other questions about this, you can email us at smallsystems at syr.edu. And for a little bit about us here in the Environmental Finance Center Network, our program provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all 50 states and territories to help local water systems achieve their goals and stay in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And here you can see the various centers that make up the environmental network. You can see that we have centers and partner organizations spread across the entire country for this year's programming. We work together to create solutions for difficult how to pay issues of environmental protection and improvement. And on that note, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. We have Rose Afandi, the Tribal Drinking Water Program Specialist at the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. And we also have Matt Ziegler with us today the Tribal Drinking Water Program Director at the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. So Rose, welcome, and I hand everything over to you. Thank you, Savannah, I appreciate it. My name is Rose Afandi, I'm with the Southwest Environmental Finance Center. And as Savannah mentioned, we work together with the drinking water operators, utility operators, and uh, today our main topic is basic water math for utility operator certification. So I hope we are going to have a good presentation today and we can learn a little more about what's going on with operator certification. So why should we care about water math? First and most important, it's for public health protection. We are all in a, um, in a profession where we are required to treat our drinking water to make it safe for the public to, to consume. We also are required to uh, treat our wastewater so that we do not cause any damage when we dispose of it. Now, another important way, reason why we should care about water map is to gain the knowledge to troubleshoot and adjust our water systems. Now, as you realize, some of this water map requires that you use it on a daily basis. And if you're able to use it, it it's much better for you to adjust and uh, be a very good water operator qualified to do your job. Another reason is we are in a profession where we are required to get licensed and part of that licensing, you are supposed to take the exam and get certified. So to be able to pass the, work, the exam, you need to be familiar with uh, water math and all the problems that will be, uh, you will be required to do on that water math exam. It's also important because learning about water math can get your career advancement. Now, once you, learn about water math and you advance in your career, you can get a promotion at your work or you can move into more um, advanced careers using that water math. 
So about the water operator certification, as I mentioned earlier, it's part of the water utility operator certification exam. And the level of math on that exam varies with the type of the exam and the level of certification. So if you're taking lower levels of the exam, you may be required to do less math. And you're if you're taking higher levels, you might be required to do more math. It also depends on the type of exam you're taking. So for example, if you're taking the water treatment exam, you might be required to do more advanced math. And if you're taking a different type of exam, you might be required to do a different type of math. So it's all dependent on where you are on your certification. Now, a few tips for solving water math problems. We always encourage you guys to draw some sketches and try and visualize the problem as you try to understand the problem. Uh, a lot of our brains work with uh, visual, visual cues, and so drawing sketches can really help you understand and solve the problem better. It's important to familiarize yourself with the formula sheet before the exam, and this will be given to you probably ahead of the exam. So if you're familiar with it, then you will know how to utilize it to your advantage. Again, it's important for you to pay close attention to the units because this is where it can get a little confusing if you're not familiar with the units or if you find that the units are uh, kind of tricky in converting from one unit to the other. And last but not least, it's always important to practice, practice, practice. The math exam, the more you practice, the more you will be familiar in, those, uh, in uh, solving those problems and you will get through them without any problems at all. So we have several terms and definitions that you, you, need, you want to be familiar with as you approach this exam. Know what square feet mean, cubic feet, cubic feet per second, gallons per acre foot, miles, inches per foot, feet per mile. Those are terminologies that you want to be familiar with so that if you see them on an exam, you know exactly what you're being asked for. More terms to familiarize yourself, you know, things like gallons per cubic feet, pounds per gallon, pounds per square inch, gallons per day, gallons per minute, million gallons, million gallons per day. Those are very important terminologies and terms for you to be familiar with as you prepare to take these exams. I mentioned earlier about formula sheets and the importance of familiarizing yourself with it. Now, most programs allow formula sheets during testing so that you don't have to memorize all the formulas that you will be using or you might use on your exam. Uh, this is an example here for ABC certifications and they give you a similar formula sheet. Of course, it comes in several pages. Uh, the important thing is you'll notice it's arranged alphabetically so that you are able to find the particular formula you're looking for. Now, if you have this ahead of time, you will know what you're looking for and where it's located. So you don't have to spend your time looking for a formula. Now on those formula sheets, uh, some of the formulas are illustrated as a pie wheel. You know, some of us might want to use this uh, to solve our problems. So I wanted to make sure that we know how to use these pie wheels. The important thing about pie wheels is it's divided into two. Now, if you look at it as a half, the top half must balance the bottom half of the wheel. So in this case, uh, the top half is one side of the equation, while the lower part is the other side of the equation. Now, to write this out as an equation, it would be you take the upper part, which is chemical feed uh, in pounds per day, would be equal to the flow in million gallons, multiply by the dose in milligrams per liter, multiply by 8.34 pounds per gallon, which is a conversion factor, and all these multiplied together should give you the correct answer. One important thing to note though, however, is that your units must match the units that are in the pie wheel. So if you have a flow, it has to be in million gallons per day or in million gallons if you're looking for a static volume. So there will be some conversions that you might require to do, but it's important to know how to use this. So another quick tip, um, avoid making common mistakes with your units. This is where a lot of people have a problem with, and uh, the examiner knows this, so they will throw in some problems just to throw you off. So for example, you might get a problem that gives you 10 feet, six inches. Uh, one thing is that 
it's you can easily convert this to 10.6 or your brain might want to convert it to 10.6 but that is not going to be correct because we have feet and inches and so they are not similar units there is one more step you need to do and that is convert those inches into feet and so 6 divided by 12 we will we get 0 0.5 feet so 10 feet 6 inches is equivalent to 10.5 feet not 10.6 feet similarly 5 feet 9 inches is not equal to 5.9 feet the conversion factor has to come into effect and 5 feet 9 inches is equivalent to 5.75 feet so watch out for those little um, uh, common mistakes that we tend to make on our math problems and you should be good if you're aware of that so amongst the topics we're going to cover today we're going to deal with averages fractions and percents we're going to also talk about areas volumes conversions and then water pressure head and flow and velocity and dosage calculations and as we deal with each, with each of these topics we're going to go through examples and so if you can follow those examples with me and if you have any questions we can answer them just take note of the slide number and we can answer them at the end of the session so there are a few basic math concepts that i'd like you to be familiar with just because we use them so often in a lot of these math problems so uh, one of those is an exponent and what is an exponent an exponent is a number that is multiplied by itself a specified number of times or it is also the power of a number for example if you have three squared the number three is the base and the number two is the exponent so this simply written out is three multiplied by three so two threes multiplied together in this case the answer is nine a second concept is the square root concept and this is the number that gives you the original value when multiplied by itself it is the opposite of an exponent and so if you take for example the square root of four will give you two that one is simply equals to two multiplied by itself will give you four so square roots are the opposite of exponents a third concept i uh, want you to be familiar with our averages otherwise known as mean and this is where all values in a set are added together or they're summed up together and the sum is divided by the number of values in that set for example if you have been given a set of the numbers one two three and six you will simply add all those numbers together in this case our sum is 12 and then we'll take 12 and we will we'll divide by four four being the number of uh, the number of numbers in that set and our answer here is three so three would be our average number okay so our first problem we are going to look at is uh, to illustrate the averages uh, you might get a problem like this and this is something that we re that's realistic as a, as a drinking water operator question on monday at 8 a.m the reading on the master meter was 1,523,951 gallons on Thursday at 8 a.m., the meter was reading 2 million gallons, 859,230 gallons. What was the average daily consumption during this time? So when you get a problem like this, the first thing you ask yourself is, what do we have? And so write down what you have been given. And from this problem, we, can, we want to find out the difference in gallons pumped between those two days. So we will take those two numbers and subtract them and our the difference between them is 1,335,279 gallons. Now that's quite a mouthful and at this stage you you might be tempted to round off this number because it's kind of you know very long and very tedious but it's important to leave this number as it is because we don't want to round off before we get to the final answer. We also know that the time elapsed between those uh, those two values was three days. And so now we go ahead and look at our, our formula sheet and if we have any formulas that we can use. So the average daily consumption here would be the gallons pumped divided by the days that have elapsed. And so if you take those two, you took those numbers and you plug them in, 
when you divide them, your answer comes to 445,093 gallons per day. So how do you know it's gallons per day? You just take gallons per day. We haven't canceled out any units, so we still have it as gallons per day. So at this point is when you can round it off to a number that uh, uh, you might expect to see on the numbers that you have available and the answers you have available. In this case, we're going to round it down to 445,000 gallons per day. So that's our answer. Let's talk a little bit about fractions, just uh, so we understand well what they are. Fractions are part of a whole number. And in fractions, we have the top number, which is the numerator, and the bottom number, which is the denominator. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. fractions, um, mm -hmm. now one thing to note is that mm -hmm. all numbers, mm -hmm. all whole numbers have a denominator mm -hmm. of one that is not always written out. Mm -hmm. For example, the number five mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm can be written out mm -hmm. as five over one. So mm -hmm. we don't normally put the one, but mm -hmm. we know it's there. It's kind mm -hmm. of a silent one. Mm -hmm. So one out of mm -hmm. two is a half, mm -hmm. one out of four is a quarter, mm -hmm. and so forth, and so forth. Mm -hmm. A whole number is simply one. Now, percents of fractions where the denominator is equal to 100. So in water math applications, we have different areas where we use this. For example, um, hypochlorite solutions, you might be given hypochlorite solution of maybe 65%, 12.5%, or 100%. And we will talk more about that in a minute. So one thing to note is that percents can be converted into fractions and vice versa. So for example, 1% is simply one out of 100. So written out as a fraction, 1% is one out of 100. And if you have 5%, it would be 5 out of 100. To change a percent into a decimal, um, so you can simply drop the percent sign and you can divide the number by 100. If you have a 65% solution and you want to turn it into a decimal, you will take 65 divided by 100 and your answer is 0 0.65. Similarly, to change a decimal to a percent, Simply multiply the decimal by 100, and then you will add the percent sign. So if you have 0 0.12 as a decimal, multiply by 100, you will get 12, and then you add the percent sign. That will be a conversion from decimal to percent. Now, it's important to note one thing when answering math problems, and that is the order of operations, otherwise known as PEMDAS. And so, what is this uh, we talk about when we uh, talk about order of operations? It's a rule that tells you the sequence to follow when solving math problems. So this sequence uh, requires that you go in a certain order. An easier way to remember it is to say, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And uh, so when we're beginning, we'll go with parentheses first. We want to take care of parentheses first, and then exponents next. And then we will multiply and divide or divide next. And lastly, we will do our additions and our subtractions. If you follow these orders, this will be, um, you will find the correct answer. So to illustrate this, we will do a simple problem where we're given, you might find this on your, on your math problems. Calculate the area of a circle. So in this case, we have our formulas on our formula sheet. The area of a circle is pi r squared or 0 0.785 multiplied by the diameter squared. Write out what you have. It's important to note what you have. We know pi is 3.14. The diameter of this circle is 40 feet. And therefore, automatically, we know the radius is half of the diameter. So 40 feet divided by 2 is 20 feet. So to use the first formula here, uh, which is area, we want to find the area of this circle. Area is equal to pi multiplied by the radius squared. So if you plug in your numbers, 3.14, the radius squared is what we want to include here. And we want to write it out and take care of our parentheses first before we proceed on. So if we write this out, that will be 3.14 and 20 feet multiplied by 20 feet because it's 20 feet squared, 20 feet multiplied by itself. So we will address everything that's inside the parentheses before we proceed. 20 feet multiplied by 20 feet is 400 feet squared. 
Now we can go ahead and open our parentheses and multiply everything out and our area comes to 1,256 square feet. Now, it depends on the second formula, you will get the same thing. It's only depending on which one you feel comfortable using. So in this case, the area requires you to use the diameter instead of the radius, so 0.785 multiplied by the diameter squared. So if you plug in your, uh, your, your uh, available values, in this case, we're not using 20 feet, we're using the diameter. And a lot of people can make mistakes here. So 40 feet, multiply by 40 feet because we have diameter squared and the answer here is 1600 square feet so you multiply that out and yes you get the same answer we got if we were using the other formula so know how to use these formulas whichever you're comfortable with go with that and then follow the order of operations now let's talk about the next topic, and this is about volumes. And to begin with, we're going to talk about volumes of cylinders. Now there's several applications where you'll find cylinders. Uh, as, op as water operators, you might be a drinking water operator and we have these water storage tanks out there and reservoirs. Some of them are cylindrical shaped, some of them are rectangular shaped, but look at it as a cylinder, a big cylinder in this case. Now for those pipes that are in the ground, you know, they run for several miles, but those are just cylinders lying in the ground. They're just part of a cylinder application. Also for those of us who have groundwater wells, your wells are actually cylinders, you know, cylindrical uh, volumes that you will need to uh, know how to get the volume of that. So those are applications that you might come across as you do your daily work. So let's do some problems in dealing with volumes of cylinders. And um, our first question is, calculate the volume in cubic feet and in gallons. And we have a cylindrical tank right here. So this problem has two different parts. A lot of us get caught because we might answer half the problem and not go to the very end and we will get the wrong answer or we might not be given credit for halfway when we go there. So this has to be completed, you have to get it in the answer in cubic feet and in gallons. So I'm going to walk you through that. Again, to begin with, ask, what do we have? We know pi is 3.14. We know our diameter across the tank is 40 feet. And therefore, our radius is half the diameter, which is 20 feet. And the height is 30 feet. So having written down what I have, I can go ahead and try to answer my question. So my volume is equal to pi r squared multiplied by the height. So let's see, I have all these parameters. I'm going to put them or plug them into my equation, 3.14 multiplied by 20 feet squared. So I have to take care of these parentheses before I proceed on. 20 feet squared simply means 20 feet multiplied by itself twice and that gives me 400 square feet so once i plug in all my numbers i can open up the parentheses and i go ahead and multiply those two numbers out my volume therefore comes to 37,680 cubic feet now where did i get this i simply multiplied the units you have to remember to multiply the units as well so feet squared multiply by feet is where I get cubic feet. So it's important to remember to multiply your units as well. And that's where you know where your units are being canceled and where they are remaining. That's the answer. Now we've, de we've dealt with the first part. We have our volume in cubic feet, but I'm not done with that problem. And if you leave it at this level, you will get it wrong. So part B of that problem is we need to be able to calculate the volume in gallons. And to be able to do that, there will be a conversion from cubic feet to gallons. So this is where you go back to your formula sheet and you look at what you have, some of those units that you have conversions. So we have our volume from the previous slide as 37,680 cubic feet. Our conversion factor, we know that one cubic foot of water is equivalent to 7.48 gallons. Now, just a quick tip to note here. If you look at this conversion factor, 
we have one cubic foot of water, of water equivalent to 7.48 gallons. There will always be more gallons than cubic feet. So if you're making a, making a conversion from cubic feet to gallons, your answer will be significantly larger because of this conversion factor here. So if you're wondering whether you should divide or multiply, just use this as a cube. You will always have more cubic feet than gallons. So let's go ahead and do our conversion. One cubic foot of water is equivalent to 7.48 gallons. We want to know 37,680 cubic feet. How many gallons is that? So you, to set up this problem, make sure you include your units as well, and that way you'll know where your units are cancelling out. You will take 37,680 multiplied by 7.48 and divide it by one cubic foot. That's where you'll notice the cubic feet go with the cubic feet, they cancel out, and your answer comes to 281,846.4 gallons. So gallons is what is the unit that's remaining here. So it's what's left standing, and I will just transfer it to my answer. And I will go ahead and round this answer up to 282,000 gallons, or depending on the available options you have on your answer key. So we have solved both parts of the problem. And so be able to know how to convert from gallons to cubic foot or cubic foot to gallons and vice versa. Let's talk about the next volume to a topic and that's volumes of rectangles. Uh, it's important to know how to use this and the applications you can see out there. Um, this rectangular storage tanks, you, you might have some of these in your at your utility, you might think of it as a rectangular storage tank or reservoir. Now, fill dirt and excavations, it's hard to think of them as rectangular volumes, but if you do think of it, it is just a long stretch of a rectangular box where across we have the width, we have the length, and then we have the depth. So, if you have to uh, fill up uh, an excavation, you might be required to do a volume. Normally, the units are in cubic feet or cubic yards of dirt. So let's go ahead and do a problem about this that you might come across. Uh, how many cubic yards of dirt must be ordered to fill in a trench of dimensions? Length is 400 feet, width is four feet, and diameter is, um, uh, sorry, and depth is three feet. So I have put, it, I mentioned earlier, it's important to draw a sketch so you can put in your values and know what you're looking at. So our length is 400 feet, across the width is four feet, and the depth is three feet. We also know that the volume of a rectangle, of a rectangular object is the length multiplied by the width multiplied by the diameter. Another conversion factor, we know one foot is equivalent to 12 inches. And one yard is equivalent to three feet, and one cubic yard, therefore, is equivalent to 27 cubic feet. So now we're ready to go ahead and solve this problem. Volume is equal to the length, multiplied by the width, multiplied by the depth. I have all my values, they are all in the same dimensions, so I can multiply them out. 400 multiplied by four, multiplied by three feet. My answer comes to 4,800 cubic feet, feet times feet times feet gives you cubic feet, and that's a volume. Now let's go back to the question, how, how have we answered the question? And the answer is no. They asked us for the answer to be in cubic yards of dirt. So we know that we have to make a conversion from cubic feet to cubic yards. And so the conversion factor we're going to use here is uh, one cubic yard is equivalent to 27 cubic feet. And if you want to know how many cubic yards are in 4,800 cubic feet, you have to do a division. So 4,800 cubic feet multiplied by one cubic yard divided by 27 cubic feet. Cubic feet will cancel with cubic feet. And we come up with an answer of 177.777. And so that would be rounded up to 178 cubic yards. So make sure as you get an answer, ask yourself whether you have answered the question and what they are asking for. In this case, they asked for how many cubic yards 
and our answer is in QBQ. So that's answered. The next topic we are going to talk about is water pressure. And this is um, a topic that you will deal with as you do your job. The pressure is a force per unit area, and it's usually measured in pounds per square inch, otherwise known as PSI. This is useful in managing water storage tanks, and uh, you might be able to do a conversion from feet of water to PSI and vice versa. So it's, it's, it's meaningful to maintain a good range of pressure in your distribution because we know it's important to have a very good range based on your type of water system. If you have too high, generally if you have too low pressure, you might get into issues like water backflow and uh, this is a contamination concern. You might uh, end up introducing contamination into your water system. Too low pressures, you might get an issue with lack of firefighting capacity. And so you wanna be, you wanna make sure that your firefighters are able to take care of emergencies that uh, might arise in the distribution. Customer complaints, you might get a lot of complaints if their water pressure is too low in people's tubs. Now, when you get too high pressure, when pressures become too high, you might end up with water main breaks, which is something we all wanna try and avoid. Um, too high, you might get into increased stability and that will bring an issue with contamination. You might introduce some um, you know, contaminants into your system. You don't want to have that. Again, your customers will complain if their pressure is also too high. So water pressure head, when considering pressure in a water column, it's important to know that the column of the water, or the column high is what matters. That is the hydraulic head. So we have formulas on your formula sheet. We know that one PSI of uh, one PSI of pressure is equivalent to 2.31 feet of water, or alternatively, one foot of water is equivalent to 0 0.433 psi. So once you are whichever you are familiar with or whichever you're comfortable with, any of these formulas will give you the correct answer. Okay, let's take a Let's take an example to illustrate that. Uh, what is the pressure in PSI at the bottom of each tank? Now we have two different types of tanks here. This is a groundwater storage tank to my, to my left, and we have an elevated storage tank to my right. Now if you look, um, the water level in both tanks is at 50 feet, and we wanna know what is the pressure reading at the bottom of each of those tanks. So the first, uh, we're gonna use the first um, equation to solve for this one. We know that one foot of water is equivalent to 0 0.433 PSI, and we know how much water is in the tank. So we wanna know how many, how much PSI does 50 feet of water give us? So if you uh, write that out, it will be 50 feet multiplied by 0 0.433 divided by one foot. So feet and feet cancel, and you are left with 50 multiplied by 0 0.433, and the answer gives you 22 PSI. So let's see about this elevated tank. Let's use the other formula that we have. 2.31 feet of water is equivalent to one PSI. So we wanna know how much PSI is 50 feet of water. So if you set that up well, that would be 50 feet of water multiplied by one PSI divided by 2.31 feet. Feet will cancel with feet, and what we are left with is 22 PSI. So looking at both problems, we used two different formulas. We have two different storage tanks. The volume in both tanks might be different. The only thing that matters at this level, at this point, is the height of the water. So you, whether you have um, 100 gallons or if you have 500 gallons in there, it doesn't matter. It's just the height of the column that matters. So pressure head of water, pressure depends on water head only, that's the height of the water. Now talking a little bit about water pressure, you might be given a more complex problem that involves pressure, and this is more of a realistic problem you might, we, you might see out in the distribution. Um, you might have uh, your tank located on a, in a remote area, maybe on top of a hill, and you do have homes that are serving water from the tank. 
And as you make your daily rounds, you might grab a pressure reading at one of the homes and without any other way of knowing how much water is left in your tank, you can simply use the pressure in the distribution to determine um, how much water is left in the tank. That is, if you have no other way of doing of, of knowing that. Um, so question, how much water is in the tank if the pressure reading at this first customer by the base of the hill is 30 psi? So this customer has 30 psi and we want to know how much water is in that tank that's at the top of that hill. The hill has an elevation of 40 feet. That's another detail that we have. But we also know that one PSI of water is equivalent to 0.21 feet. The first thing you want to do is you want to convert that 30 PSI into feet of water. We want to know how much does that equate to. So following that conversion, we know that um, one PSI is 2.31 feet. So 30 PSI would be equal to 30 PSI multiplied by 2.31 divided by one PSI. PSI will cancel with PSI. Multiply out, we get 69.3 feet. That's what's left here. The units that are left without being canceled. So what does this number mean, actually? This number means it's the height of the sorry, the height of the hill added to the water height inside the tank. That's what's giving you this uh, head of water. And so with this information, we can go ahead and get the water in the tank by itself. So we will take this number that we got here, which is an addition of the hill and the water in the tank, and we subtract what we have. We know what how the elevation of the hill, which is 40 feet. If we take 69.3 feet and we subtract 40 feet, that's the elevation of the hill, we are left with 29.3 feet. Now, 29.3 feet, we are rounding it down to 29. And so now we know that the height of the water in the tank is about 29 feet. And that's about halfway because the tank is you know, 50 feet high. So it's about halfway down into the tank. You can use these pressure readings to your advantage if you have no other way of knowing how much water is in the tank. Just grab a pressure and knowing a few other details, you can be able to do a conversion and get to know this detail. Let's talk a little bit about flow and velocity. And uh, flow and velocity are two different, uh, two different uh, parameters here. Flow is equal to the cross-sectional area and that would be multiplied by the velocity. Now, flow is how much volume of water is passing through the pipes at a given time. On the contrary, velocity is how fast that water is traveling. So a lot of people confuse this, but you have to know cubic feet is a volume, while feet alone is just a length. So make sure you don't confuse those two because it does get a little confusing. This should be on your formula sheet. Flow is equal to area multiplied by velocity. So you'll find that formula on your formula sheet. Let's make an let's do an example. We want to know, calculate the flow of water in a six-inch pipe with a velocity of 10 feet per second. Now, one thing you need to do is write down what you have. We've been given the velocity as 10 feet per second. We also know that 12 inches is equivalent to one foot. And so when you are given six inch pipe, six inch pipe means six inches is the diameter of the pipe. Now we need to be able to convert that inches from inches to feet because we want to deal with feet. We want to be able to, con uh, to multiply similar uh, units because um, it will give us a better answer. So six inches is equivalent to 0 0.5 feet. That is the diameter, and the radius will be half of that, which is three inches, and that would be 0 0.25 feet. So to be able to get the cross-sectional area of that pipe, we will take the um, area is equals to pi r squared. And so pi is 3.14. My radius, I just got it at 0 0.25 feet squared is multiplied the radius by itself and I'm finding an area of 0 0.196 feet squared. So I have my area, I have my velocity and now I think I can go ahead and solve that problem.
My flow in cubic feet per second will therefore be the area multiplied by the velocity. And so I'll plug in my numbers. I have my area as 0 0.9, 0 0.196 feet squared. I just calculated it here. And I was given my velocity as 10 feet per second. So if I multiply that out, my flow becomes 1.96 cubic feet per second. And I can run that out to 2 cubic feet per second, otherwise 2 CFS. So some of these terminologies, it is the same thing. You can either write it this way, but it's also just the same as CFS cubic feet per second. One other part of being a utility operator is being able to do important chlorine dosage and feed rate form, uh, calculations. And we're going to look at several form, some formulas that you will be required to use. We, the first one is the uh, dosage formula where we have the dosage equal to the demand added to the residual. And we will go into detail in, in a little bit. The next formula to be aware of is how much uh, pounds of chlorine gas you can add into a water system, into a water volume. That's you need to have the volume in million gallons multiplied by the dosage, multiplied by the 8.34 pounds per gallon as a conversion factor. If you're dealing with HTH or solid uh, chlorine, you will be required to use the same formula, but there is a percent uh, strength to it, and so you will be required to divide it by decimal strength of uh, the chemical you're using. The same thing applies to liquid chlorine. So the best way to do is to understand these formulas is to do an example and uh, understand that. So let's look at the first formula, which is the chlorine dosage formula. And it's important to know this formula because you will need it. And I can assure you, you will need it if you're taking the math exam. So let's be able to understand this. Dosage is what you add into the water, the amount of chlorine you add into the water, and that's in milligrams per liter. So when you add the chlorine into the water, some of it is used up by whatever is in the water, it could be contaminants, it could be other things that are in the water, they use up some of that chlorine. All that is known as the demand. It's also measured in milligrams per liter. And so what is left over after the demand has been um, taken, I mean, after demand has taken some of that chlorine, is the residual chlorine. And that's also measured in milligrams per liter. So this equation can be rearranged to solve for any of the three parameters. You simply have to isolate the unknown, and then you'll be able to solve for any of these. So if you're looking for demand and you have been given the residual and the dosage, you can rearrange the equation and solve for the unknown. It's important to understand this formula will not always be given on your formula sheets. They expect you to understand this if you're a water operator, drinking water operator, that dosage, demand, and residual go hand in hand, and what refers to what. So let's do an example to understand this. Calculate the residual chlorine if the demand is 2 milligrams per liter and the dosage is 2.8 milligrams per liter. So write out the values that you have. We have the demand as 2 milligrams per liter, the dosage is 2.8. We also know our formula, we just saw it in the previous slide, which is dosage is equal to the demand added to the residual. So as I mentioned before, what we are looking for today or on this problem is the residual chlorine. So we want to be able to isolate that from that equation, and then we can solve for the unknown. Isolating the residual, we subtract demand from both sides, and we are left with residual is equal to the dosage, subtract the demand. So moving that and using that to calculate what they're asking us, the residual is equal to the dosage, subtract the demand. We have both the dosage and the demand. 2.8 milligrams per liter is our dosage. Our demand is 2 milligrams per liter. If you subtract those two, we get our residual chlorine as 0 0.8 milligrams per liter. Now, this is where you go back to your question and find out if you actually uh, have answered the question. Calculate the residual chlorine. And so our answer is residual chlorine. And I think we did that's the end of that problem.
Now, um, I'm going to revisit the pie wheel issue, and this is uh, because we're going to be dealing with uh, feed rates and how much to add into the water, how much dosage uh, of chemical to add into the water. So if you remember that pie wheels are basically a representation of the formula. In this case, this pie wheel, I, if, you read, if you write it out, it's equivalent to this formula that's here. The feed rate in pounds per day is equal to the flow multiplied by the dose multiplied by 8.3 form. Now, this formula is not only uh, limited to chlorine, it can also be used to calculate fluoride or alum or any other chemical that you add into the water. So all you need to do is be aware of what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve. Now, if you might notice they take note of the chemical strength. So if you do not have 100% purity, you know that uh, you, you need to know how to take care of that to make sure that you're getting the correct answer depending on what uh, percent strength you're using. So gas chlorine, if some of us use gas chlorine for disinfection, that is normally equated to about 100% strength. Now, if you're using solid chlorine or calcium hypochlorite, also known as HTH, that's approximately 65% strength. And in a decimal form, it will be 0 0.65. Liquid chlorine, I think most of us are familiar with this, it's about 10 to 12.5%. And so as a decimal, you will divide that by 100 and you get 0 0.1 to 5 as a decimal. Okay, so let's take a look at an or a, at a question that you might find on your exam. Uh, and that's the feed and the dosage. How many pounds of calcium hypochlorite, HTH, should you use to treat a 700,000 gallon tank to get a residual of, a, a residual chlorine of 1.5 milligrams per liter when the demand is 2.6 milligrams per liter? So it gets a little wordy, but just uh, understand how, how to approach this and you will be fine because you know your dosage formula is equivalent to demand added to your residual. In that case, to get our dosage, we will take what we have. We have been given the demand as 2.6 milligrams per liter, and we also know that the residual would be 1.5 milligrams per liter. So our dosage here is 4.1 milligrams per liter. We also have been given a volume, 700,000 gallons, and that converted into million gallons is you will divide it by a million and uh, you get 0 0.7 million gallons. We also know that we are dealing with calcium hypochlorite and normally that's about 65% strong. And in decimal, we have that at 0 0.65. So writing out our formula, feed formula for chlorine in pounds, uh, we have it as the volume in million gallons multiply by the dosage in milligrams per liter, multiply by 8.34 pounds per gallon. And you keep seeing this conversion factor here, 8.34 pound, pound, pounds per gallon. That's simply how much um, a gallon of water weighs, 8.34 pounds. So then we have to divide it by the strength of the chemical. In this case, uh, we're dealing with hypochlorite calcium and that's 65% strength. So if you plug in the numbers that you have, 0 0.7 million gallons of water, multiply by the dosage, which we calculated right here, which is 4.1 milligrams per liter, eight, multiply by 8.34 pounds per gallon, then we have to divide that by the decimal strength, which is 65 multiplied by, divided by 100. So if you write that out and uh, we just, I just made sure that 0 0.65 is the value we are looking for down here. We come up with an answer of 36.8 pounds. Now that can be rounded up to 37 pounds. And so how many pounds of calcium hypochlorite do you need to disinfect a 700,000 gallon tank? Your answer would be 37 pounds. Now on your answer sheet, you might get maybe an answer that's closest to that. They might even say 40 pounds or maybe 37 pounds. You choose the answer that's closest to whatever you have calculated. 
So having said that, that comes to the end of our uh, math session and uh, we're going to start with the Q&A session. So if you have any questions that you had or uh, you had asked uh, earlier on, this is when we'll go ahead and, and try and answer your questions. Hi, yes, Rose, this is Matt Ziegler. Um, we did have one question about whether or not calculators are provided during the exam and I did answer that that um, yes, you will be allowed to use a calculator during the exam and the testing location uh, typically is the uh, place that will provide it for you. Um, if you have any other questions, please make sure to enter them into the question box. Yes, I thank you, Matt. Any others, any others right now? Thank you. So if you don't mind, Rose, you know, we can give folks a few more minutes here to submit any questions that they have, and I can do um, my quick two follow-up points just to give folks a few more minutes here. So yes. I am sending out the evaluation link in the chat box, so if you have a few moments to let us know your thoughts and any feedback from today's webinar, that is very appreciated and beneficial to the Environmental Finance Center Network. And lastly, we have our standard poll question. If folks are interested um, in technical assistance, the Environmental Finance Center does offer this for small water systems. Um, you can learn more about topics and get connected with experts on some of these topics like today. So we'll leave this open for about another five seconds. And we'll get ready to close this poll in three, two, one. All right, so I will pass it back over to you, Matt. It looks like we received a, a, just a few questions. Yeah, um, so thank you. Yeah, and, and Savannah, maybe you could answer if these are recorded to watch later. Yes, so this presentation, PowerPoint slide, and the video recording will be available on the efcnetwork.org website. All the folks that registered for this webinar will be receiving a follow-up email um, by tomorrow or early next week that will include links to all of these resources. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we did have one question, where is the best source for practice questions? And really for me, the best place to practice is at your own water system. It's really kind of looking at the tank that's on the hill and knowing how many feet you know, tall that tank is and being able to, you know, determine what the pressure is, what the PSI is, or or doing a dosage calculation on your disinfection pump, or, you know, looking at a trench and, and trying to figure out how much filter you would need. Um, so practice at your water system is, is uh, super important. It's the only way that you're going to be able to implement this math in your day-to-day -day, uh, routine. But if you do need other uh, um, help with uh, uh, water math, um, the Association of the Boards of Certification website um, does have some practice exam material. Uh, it's an excellent resource um, specifically for math, as well as uh, at your different states. Um, your different states should have uh, some practice uh, materials as well as study materials for you. Rose, do you have anything further to add to the best place to, to look for practice questions? Uh, no, I think what you mentioned is correct. A lot of uh, uh, certifying agencies have these online materials and uh, you just uh, go to their website and they're always available on the website and you can do a lot of practice, practice problems. But the important thing is it's good if you applied it, you applied this in real life because it gives you a different perspective of answering them. And now, Rose and Matt, do you think you could, uh, you know, send that URL to me? Because I can include that in the follow-up email to attendees if you think it would be worth to send that out with them. Um, that sounds like a, a good idea. We'll go ahead and uh, and get some URLs over to you to include. Perfect. All right. Well, it looks like right now we have not had any more questions submitted. Now, Rose, um, is this this that's your email up there? So anybody you know can contact you if they have any 
direct questions. Yes, that's our email right there. We will answer any questions that you have. And uh, if you remember later on when you're reviewing the slides and you have a question on any of the slides, just send us an email and we will follow up with you later. All right, great. Well, I do, you know, thank you so much, Rose, for being here today to provide your expertise. That was um, that was great. And thank you, Matt, for being here to help moderate this session. I will pass it over to you, Rose, if you have any last wrap up points. OK, as I mentioned earlier on, um, it wouldn't all this math that we dealt with today. It's all applicable to any applications that you have out there, whether you are a a drinking water utility uh, operator or if you are a wastewater utility operator i'm sure you can use some of the concepts we used here or we saw today and practiced on so for all the different programs that you do have just follow up with the individual programs that you're certified in and find out um, more more information about how much math you need to study ahead of time and the topics that you need to uh, to know before you go in to approach these uh, problems and for the most part, they will give you guidance and that way you can adequately prepare and know what or how to focus your attention, how to focus your preparation in answering the math questions. Uh, but I do wish you all the best as you attempt these questions. And uh, math is always a matter of practicing, practicing and practicing. And you get very comfortable as you, you keep on practicing. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.